If you have your Bibles, turn to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. I'm going to be looking at the first 11 verses of this chapter. And the title of my message is The Results of God's Love. The Results of God's Love. In our text, it says God's love has been poured out into our hearts. And uh, I want to take a look at that for a few minutes this morning. Starting in verse 1, it says this. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, and we preached on that a couple of weeks ago, but we've been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we talked about grace a few weeks ago on Wednesday night at Bible study. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who, is, who has been given to us. Verse six. You see, at just the right time when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Verse 9. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Let's bow our hearts in prayer. Lord, as we look at your word today, I pray you would speak to every person, Lord, listening today. For every person in the room and every person online, Lord, help us to understand what you want us to, to see today, what you want us to experience today, what you want us to hear today. Lord, I just pray you would lead and guide this message in Jesus' name, amen. In verses five through eight, if I can get the clicker working, it says God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. And in verse eight it says, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And in that passage of scripture it says, yeah, if, if you're good enough, someone might be willing to die for you. But in general, people, as you go through life, people aren't offering up themselves for you. You know what I'm saying? When people tell me, pastor, please pray for so-and-so. They need a heart and double lung transplant. I have difficulty with that prayer request. How do I pray for that? Lord, please kill some really healthy person in a car accident. You understand what I'm saying? Okay, so if somebody needs a kidney, how many of you know you can donate a kidney and survive? Right? And now they're, they're doing things with the liver. They can take a part of one person's liver and, and, and transplant that in somebody and help somebody with the liver. But if somebody needs a new heart, you can't just give them your heart. You understand what I'm saying? That sacrifice is too great. But the Bible says that God loved us so much that he sent his one and only son to die in our place so we don't have to experience spiritual death. And those of you that are parents, you can think for a minute the kind of sacrifice that must be to offer your child as a sacrifice for someone else. That's love, people. That is a love that we can't imagine. That's a love that we can't understand. We can begin to understand and we can see the analogy, but that's a greater love than is, that, that love is beyond our human capacity, in my opinion, just my opinion. The Bible says that God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. God loves us so much that he gave his son. God loves us so much that he gave us his word, the Bible, to give us a guideline, not to restrict our lives, not to take all the fun and joy out of life, but just the opposite. God's commands are not burdensome. God gave it to us to protect us and to give us the best possible life we could have here on earth. And if life here on earth isn't good enough, guess what? You can turn it in for eternal life. You know what I'm saying? 
This is temporary. So in light of God's love, in light of God's love, there are some things that transpire in us. There's things that happen in us because of God's love and because of the sacrifice that Jesus made. And I wanna look at three of those. The first one is in the first two verses of Romans 5. It says this. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. We have peace through God because of what Jesus did. Because Jesus died on the cross, if we accept his free gift of salvation, we get to experience peace. I'd like to define peace. The dictionary defines peace as tranquility or freedom from disturbance, okay? An encyclopedia describes it this way. Peace is a concept of societal, society, societal friendship and harmony in the absence of hostility and violence. In a social sense, peace is commonly used to mean a lack of conflict and freedom from fear of violence between individuals or groups. So let me just explain what peace is. Peace is what's happening all over in our cities here in the United States of America right now. That's the antithesis of peace, right? That is not what's happening. But that's God's goal for us. If people in America would just live according to God's word, we could have that kind of peace. People need to accept God's love and that will change people. Now, of course, I have my own personal definition of peace. It's right there, PK, that's me, Pastor Ken. My definition of God's peace. It's the absence of anxiety, stress, unrest, or fear. If you take those negative feelings away, what's left? Peace. Now, what kind of peace is Paul speaking about here in Romans? Well, probably two kinds of peace, but the first one is peace with God, because he says, we have peace with God through Jesus Christ. We have peace with God through Jesus Christ. This has a pointer on it, right? What Jesus Christ? You see this word right here? This word right in front of Jesus? It says our Lord Jesus Christ. In the church today, we like to emphasize that Jesus is our savior and he certainly is. But in order for Jesus to be your savior, he also has to be Lord of your life. You know what that means? It means he has to be in charge. And if you want to experience God's peace in your life, you need to turn control over to Jesus. Because if you accept God's free gift of love, but then you keep living your own way, I can pretty much guarantee you, you won't experience God's peace. God's peace is the spiritual state where God is pleased with you and you have no fear of judgment from him. Peace with God is a spiritual state where God is pleased with you and you have no fear of judgment from him. Many years ago, I got an email from somebody and in the email they said, there is nothing you can do to make God displeased with you. Some of you are laughing, what's so funny? It came from a minister. <laughs> Thanks, Cody. It's not true. We have 66 books of the Bible, 39 of them are in the Old Testament, and we see over and over again how God's heart was broken because people didn't follow his way, and when they didn't follow his way, they got into trouble. We can be displeasing to God. Stop it. Right, that's been my mantra for the last few weeks. Stop it, we need to please God. We need to do what God asks us to do and as we do, we'll find peace. We won't be at odds with God anymore. All the children left, I should have kept them for this part. For children, you wanna have peace in your home? Obey your mom and dad. Thank you, Faye, for, Faye was right there with me. She knew right where I was going. One of my favorite songs, Kids songs when my kids were little was on the Donut Man videos. It was O-B-E-Y, obey your mom and dad. O-B-E-Y, make them very glad. Listen to the words they say. Obey your parents every day. O-B-E-Y, obey your mom and dad. I thought that was a great song. My kids, eh, not so much, but. 
But when we're in obedience, things go better. So on Friday, I was driving down, uh, I think, Pittston Avenue in Scranton. And I looked down at the speedometer, and I was six miles over in a 35. I was doing 41 miles an hour, and there was a cop right behind me. Now, when you do the right thing, you have peace, right? They were following me to the hospital. I was driving an ambulance. It was all good. But how many times do we get nervous when we're, we're, we're driving down the highway and a cop gets behind us? We check our speedometer. We slam on the brakes. But when we're doing the right thing, we have peace with the authorities. At work, if you do the right thing, you don't have to worry about getting in trouble with your boss. When we're living for the Lord and we're doing the right thing, we don't have to worry about getting in trouble with God. But there's a peace beyond this. There's more peace. The Bible talks over and over again that God will give us peace on earth and goodwill to men, right? Where's that from? The Christmas story. Jesus came so we could have peace on earth. Philippians chapter four, Philippians, one of my four, one of my favorite parts of the Bible. Of course, I have like a thousand favorite parts. 10,000 reasons we sang that song. Yeah, I have 10,000 favorite Bible verses. And here's some of them. Philippians 4, verses 4 through 7, it says, Rejoice in the Lord always, and I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, pre present your request to God. Verse 7. If we'll do verse 6, what does verse 7 say? And the peace of God which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. We have to do verse six. We have to give our cares to God. We have to, by prayer, communication with God, and petition, asking God, with thanksgiving, in the right attitude, we need to give our request to God, and the peace of God, and I love this, which transcends all understanding. What does that mean? That means God's peace is confusing. No, it is, it's confusing. When everything in your life is wrong and you feel good, does that make sense? But can God do that? When you're going through a difficult time and people look at you and you got a smile on your face and people look at you and say, you're crazy. This often happens to me, by the way. Not the difficult things, but people looking at me and saying, I'm crazy. And you have peace knowing that God's gonna take care of it, it's because it transcends our understanding. The modern version of that is it blows your mind. God's peace can be there even in your most difficult time. I quit saying, and it's been a long time since I've been in a situation that was extremely difficult, that was overwhelming. It's been, it's been some years. But I quit saying, this is the most difficult thing I've ever gone through. Because sure enough, something trumps it later. <laughs> in my life, I've been through some very difficult times. I've been through some spiritually low times. I've mentioned it before, but back in, in my, my first pastorate, right after my first pastorate, after two and a half years of ministry, I burned out in ministry back in the 90s. And I learned a lot from that experience. It's so hard when you're called to ministry and then you have to step out of ministry because you just can't do it anymore but I learned things and I built safeguards and in every ministry experience, I've learned more and more. But one thing I've learned in life, not just in ministry, is that God is always with you in whatever situation you're in. That just like Jesus was with the disciples in the boat when the storm hit and Jesus, they woke up Jesus, they were afraid and Jesus spoke to the storm and it stopped. Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, Abednego got thrown into a fiery furnace God didn't put the fire out. God joined them there. <laughs> God just went in the fire with them. And it was so miraculous, it said that when they came out of the fire, they didn't even smell like smoke. I've been around fire. How many of you love fire? Yeah, I love fire, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you have a campfire in your backyard, you go to bed, your hair smells like smoke. It smells good, you go to sleep, smell in the campfire. 
God is with us and he gives us his peace. Jesus promised peace. Not only did he promise peace, but he gave it to his disciples. In John 14, 27, Jesus said, peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give it to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Why? Because Jesus will give you peace. In John 16, 33, I have told you these things. Again, Jesus is speaking. I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I've overcome the world. Jesus promised to give us peace even though we're gonna have trouble in the world. I'm not one of those preachers that say, if you give your life to Christ, everything's gonna be easy. Because I know better. If Jesus said you're gonna have trouble, can't argue with Jesus. And then in John chapter 20, after his resurrection, Jesus died on the cross for our sins and he came back to life. And in John chapter 20, he meets with the disciples. Remember he promised them peace? He meets with the disciples and it says, on the evening of the first day of the week, on Sunday, at a Sunday night service at Jerusalem First Assembly of God. When the disciples were together and the doors were locked for fear of the Jewish leaders. Our doors are locked, but not for fear of the Jewish leaders. Jesus came and he stood among them and he said, peace be with you. And after he said this, he showed them his hands and he showed them his side. And the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. And again, Jesus said, in case you didn't hear the first time, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. And I believe in my the theological understanding, it was at that moment they became born again. Because at that moment, the Holy Spirit entered them. Because finally, Jesus had died on the cross and he rose from the dead. The penalty for our sins has been paid for. And at that moment, they became children of God. And the Holy Spirit was in them. And you know what came in them with the Holy Spirit? Peace. Because Jesus said, peace I give you. Because God loves us, we can have peace. Now, before I show the next slide, how many of you know that it's a sin to brag? Or it's at least not healthy. What about boasting? Is it okay to boast? Okay, how many grandparents do we have here? Okay, put your hands down. How many proud grandparents do we have here? Yeah, okay. How many of you boast about your grandkids? How many of you cannot look on Melanie's Facebook timeline without seeing grandkids? They're everywhere. And when they come to our house, now she's trained the third one already. It's still, they're going to grandma's house. Aren't you going to grandpa's house? Nope, I'm going to grandma's house. There is some boasting that's okay. In verse two, verse five, and verse 11, it talks about boasting. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God and hope does not disappoint us. Hope does not disappoint us. Verse 11, not only in this, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ through whom we have now received reconciliation. I'm a Christian and I'm proud of it. I'm also the humblest person I know and I'm proud of that too. Not really, I'm just kidding. What is hope? What is hope? I love this definition of hope. How many of you know Pastor Ken is an optimist? Anybody know this? What did the optimist say when he fell off the cliff? So far, so good. So far, so good. One definition of hope is this. Hope is an optimistic state of mind that is based on an expectation of positive outcomes with respect to events and circumstances in one's life or the world at large. Wow, that's a lot of positive stuff. Do you have hope? We believe in the resurrection. I'm not gonna preach all of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, but if you read that chapter, it talks about the fact that the resurrection of Jesus Christ gives us hope. Because I'm not gonna live just to be 113 years old. That's my plan if the Lord tarries. But I'm gonna live for eternity. 
I'm going to live beyond the millennium, a thousand years. Because I have hope in Christ. And as Christians, we have the greatest hope of all. It says we boast in the hope of the glory of God. How big is God? He's infinite. God is the creator of everything. God is all-powerful. God is all-knowing. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. If our hope is based on God's glory, our hope is secure. Because nobody can compare to God. Let me just clarify something. God and the devil are not opposites. Okay? God and the devil are not equals. Okay? God created Satan to be an angel to do worship and to serve him. And he rebelled. All right? So he's a created being. God is not a created being. God has always been, and he always will. God has always lived forever. So God, there is no one that can compare to God. God's glory is amazing, overused word in our, our vocabulary. God's glory is infinite. It's unmeasurable. It's expansive. And our hope is in the all-powerful God who created everything, and there is nothing impossible with God. And if God poured his love into your heart, you should have hope. Some of you are hoping that the sermon will get over sooner. I don't know. I don't know, what do you put your hope in? Christmas is coming. Woohoo! How many of you cannot wait to go shopping on Black Friday? How many of you cannot wait to stand in line as cashiers go on break? I love that. I love it. I was in a store this week. There was like six or seven people in, and they, the guy up front, the cashier is working, and there's a second person up there. He's not, he doesn't open the second cashier. He gets on the radio. We need a cashier. So I, I hear on the radio, goes, in one minute. And I look back and goes, we're still going to need one in one minute, so it's all good. But waiting. Waiting, we as humans, we have, we have trouble waiting. But we have a hope. We have a hope of glory. We have a hope of spending eternity with Christ. We have hope. The Bible says a lot about hope. Our hope is for eternal life. I hope this clicker will start working. See, hopes are going to come true any second now. What is hope? I already said that. Missed it. All right. Oh, too far. Go back. In Titus 1, 2, in the hope of eternal life, which God, who does not lie, promised before the beginning of time. God promised us eternal life. You can bank on that. It's a hope that we have. In Titus 3, 7, so that having been justified by his grace, sermon a couple weeks ago, we might become heirs, having what? The hope of eternal life. I'm careful when I say it. I've said this from a pulpit a couple of times. I don't say it to every cancer patient, but I have said it to a few. Or people facing surgery that doesn't look promising. As Christians, when we're facing death, and 10,000 reasons, the song that we sang this morning talks about that, and when, when our, our life comes to a close. As Christians, as we face death, it's a win-win situation. If God heals us, that's awesome. We get to continue to serve him. We get to continue to be with our families. But if we die, we get to go to heaven. We get to be with Jesus. We get to be with my Uncle Jim, hoping my dad's there. We have hope, and not just for this life, for eternal life. We didn't always have hope. In Ephesians 2.12, it says, remember that at that time, you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel, and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope and without God in this world. Newsflash. Dogs may go to heaven, but not every person gets to go to heaven. Without Jesus, we don't go to heaven. Unless we make Jesus our Lord and Savior, unless we accept God's gift of eternal life, Heaven isn't for everyone. Now, if you were in our Revelation study about a year ago, 
and we looked at heaven at the end of the book of Revelation and the dimensions, there's enough room in heaven for every person who has ever lived, and scientists have estimates about how many people have ever lived. There's enough room to basically give every person who's ever lived as of this time a whole city block. That's how much space is in heaven. God did make heaven for everyone. Jesus says, I go to prepare a place for you that where I am, there you can be also. Heaven is big enough for every human that's ever lived. But heaven is only for those who will accept God into their lives, make Jesus Lord and Savior. Verse 11 says that we've received reconciliation through our Lord Jesus Christ. So it's true that once we weren't going to heaven, once we didn't have hope, but when we were reconciled to God through Jesus, now we have hope. We have hope of eternal life. A place where the temperature will be perfect. How many of you can't get the temperature right at your house right now? Anybody? Anybody turn the air on, then the heat on, then the air back on? Some of you diehards. How many of you have refused to turn the heat on yet? Can I just see? Yep, look at that. We, we got some tough people in here. Melanie turns the air on upstairs. I go downstairs and turn the heat on. Got my little space heater down there. No, it's a, it's a wall-mounted unit. All right, so moving on. Number three, the third result. You're going to like this one. I'm glad you stayed. We glory in our sufferings. I promise this is going to end well, okay? It says in verse three, not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings. We, we glory, we boast in the hope that's in God, right? But we also glory in our sufferings. That doesn't even sound good. Because we know that suffering produces perseverance and perseverance produces character and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame. About two months ago, I joined a contest with my family and then some friends joined in to lose weight over a three month period of time. It ends November 1st. Right away, someone in the group asked, what do we get if we win? What do we get if we win? And my first thought was bragging rights. Okay, because as a man with an ego that I got to keep in check, we get bragging rights. Sometimes you have to deal with your ego, but we created an incentive plan and it's all good. In the last point, we talked about boasting, and now we're talking about glory. We glory in our suffering. What is he saying? Do we brag about our sufferings? No, that's not what he's saying. Are we thrilled to suffer? Oh, I can't wait for Monday because I love to suffer, and I got to go to that one place. Whatever. Do we like to suffer? Anybody like to suffer? No, don't raise your hands, because that's a mental illness. You need to get some help. We glory in our sufferings. In other words, we rejoice or celebrate or we boast, but I believe it's in spite of our sufferings. It says in our sufferings. It doesn't say because of our sufferings. In our humanness, this doesn't make sense. But spiritually, it makes a lot of sense. Paul is not advocating that we should be happy about our suffering. Instead, he's pointing out that there can be benefits of suffering, at least in the end. All right, I don't want to get into a debate about vaccinations. But I do want to say I don't like needles. Anybody else not like needles? I don't like needles. Okay. So, but in order to get that vaccination, most of the time they're going to stick you with a pin. All right. The dentist. Most of you know how I feel about dentists. They all need to get saved. <laughs> I like the end result of going to the dentist. I don't like drilling. All right? I don't like extractions. I don't like to go to the dentist. My stomach hurts when I have to go to the dentist. <clears throat> but why do we subject ourselves to that kind of pain and suffering? There you go, some of us. To look good, I do it so I can keep eating meat. I don't want to, in my retirement, I don't want to be on soup and jello. That's all I'm saying. I still want to be eating venison and beef. And you need teeth for that. 
When we become a follower of Christ, it does not mean that all suffering goes away. As long as we live on this earth, we will experience some kind of suffering or trouble or difficulty from time to time. And sometimes more than others and some people more than others. But as we go through suffering, good things can result. And I have to use the pandemic as an example. I did not want to shut down the church for two months. Basically three months, half of March, part of June, and then all of April and May, right? But as a result of the pandemic, I've been saying for a long time, if coronavirus came from the devil, he was stupid. Because now almost every church in America is online. And they weren't a year ago. And I don't have the estimates, but I would guess less than, I know less than 50% of churches had, a, had an online presence before the pandemic. Probably more like 25% of churches. We had put the sermon online. It didn't always work. We've been doing that for, for a year, a full year before the pandemic hit, a year and a couple of weeks. But now our entire service is online. And, we, and we're reaching people that we've never reached before. And that's the way it is with lots of churches around America. So I am so glad that COVID hit America. No, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not happy that hundreds of thousands of people died of the, of the virus in the United States. But if bad things are gonna happen, I do like to see good things come out of it. And that's what Romans 8, 28 talks about. If I'm in a car accident and I smash up the front of my grill and it costs hundreds of dollars to replace it, I want to at least get some venison steaks out of the deal. You know what I'm saying? So if bad stuff happens, we want to see good stuff come out of it. Well, what does our text say? I highlighted it in red. Sufferings produce perseverance. What's perseverance? Your ability to keep going. Your ability to keep going. You become stronger because of suffering. You can handle more stuff. You can accomplish more things. Perseverance produces character. What is character? Character is the quality of doing the right thing when no one's looking. And character builds our, our Christian faith. It prepares us for glory. And character, knowing we're becoming more and more like God wants us to be, gives us hope. Takes us back to the other point. So what does suffering do? It ultimately gives us hope. You're stronger than you think. You can do it, not in your own strength, but with God's help. Romans 8.18, Paul puts it in perspective. I don't know what I'm going to do when I get to this verse. Now I can't preach it because I'm preaching it now. No, just kidding. Romans 8.18, I consider, Paul writes, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing to the glory that will be revealed in us. 2 Corinthians 1.5, for just as we share abundantly in the sufferings of Christ, so also we comfort, comfort abounds through Christ. Our comfort. Here's something good that comes out of your suffering. That when someone who doesn't know Jesus goes through a similar situation that you're going through, you can minister to them. You can encourage them. You can bless them. Something good can come from suffering. And that is perseverance, which leads to character, which leads to hope. We become better people when we're tested. But I still don't believe God specifically brings things into your life to cause you to suffer. God doesn't pop your tires, you're going down the highway at 55 miles an hour because that's what the speed limit is. But God protects you when the tire pops. And if you can't change your spare tire, God might bring somebody along to do it. Now, do you remember years ago, you were driving from Connecticut to Worcester, Mass, and you ran out of gas just before the border. This was before cell phones. And Melanie's sitting along the side of the road. I don't remember how long she was there. I think it was minutes. Till somebody from the church we used to be youth pastors at in Massachusetts sees her, pulls over, and takes care of it. God takes care of us. Wherever we are, whatever we're doing, he's with us. God is in the car with you. 
And for some of you, he's got the seatbelt on. Depends on how you drive, right? Please stand with me. I hope this works again. Can you help me out back there? As followers of Jesus Christ, because of God's love for us, we can experience peace, hope, and in spite of suffering, glory, God's glory. How? Romans 15, 13, which is my theme verse for Hamlin Assembly of God. God gave me this verse more than six years ago. It says, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Did I highlight anything in that verse? As you trust in him. If we take that out, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. That's not how it works. Our relationship with God is a partnership. If you just do your own thing, and say, God bless me, God bless me, and just do your own thing, you're not going to experience the things we talked about today, peace, hope, and God's glory. You, like everybody else, are going to experience unrest and frustration and et cetera, et cetera. But we have to partner with God. God offers us these things, but he says, as we trust in him. What does that mean? The word trust, as we obey him, as we listen to him as we as we put our faith in him as we go to him when we have needs and the other thing i didn't highlight is the last several words by the power of the holy spirit we can't do this on our own we need god working in us and today i'm afraid that as we stand here there are some of you that you don't have peace anymore some of you don't have hope. You can't see that light at the end of the tunnel. Some of you are suffering, but you don't see the end result, and so you have no hope right now, or you have little hope, or you have some peace, but not a lot of peace. Two things we need to do. First is we need to receive God's free gift of salvation. If you haven't done it, you need to do it. That's how we have peace with God. That's how we get right with God is we invite Jesus to come in and forgive our sins, and then we make Jesus Lord of our life. And then the second thing we do is we do what Jesus said. In John chapter 20, he breathed on them, and what did he say? Receive. Receive the Holy Spirit. And twice he said, peace I give you, my peace I give you. We have to receive. We have to let it go. We have to let it go. If you had a handful of coins, I'm gonna use this as an illustration. If you had a handful of coins, the other hand's tied behind your back. Maybe you have two handfuls of pennies. How much is that gonna be? How many, how many dollars is that? It's gonna be a few dollars. Maybe 10 if you have big hands. And I offer you a $50 bill. Are you gonna empty one of those hands and take it? You're gonna take it with your teeth, Mickey? Yeah, okay. And you know what's gonna happen then? I'm gonna kick you in the head, right? <laughs> so I offer you a $50 bill, but your hands are full of pennies. And you're like, I can't receive it. Dude, I don't need the pennies, give me the 50, right? And in order to receive what God has for us, we have to let go of some other stuff. You understand what I'm saying? You've gotta empty your hands so you can receive what God has for you. You need to let some stuff go. And you need to let God have it and let God have control. Let's bow our heads. Every head bowed, every eye closed. There's people watching online. We're talking to you too. If God is speaking to you, and maybe you don't have the peace that you want or that you should have, or you don't have hope, but you want to have hope, you want to have peace, I'm gonna ask you just to raise your hand and put it back down so I know how to pray for you. If, thank you, God sees your hands. If, if you need God to intervene in your life, I wanna pray with you today. God wants to help you. 
Thank you. The Bible says that to those who believed on Jesus and who received him, he gave the right to become children of God. We receive salvation by believing that Jesus died on the cross and rose again for our sins. And then we can invite him into our lives and then he'll forgive us our sins. And the Bible says he'll adopt us as his children. If you haven't done that, you need to do that this morning. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I pray for anybody that's watching online or anybody that's in the room today that hasn't accepted you as their Lord and Savior. Lord, I ask that they would pray right now. Lord, I, I pray that you would encourage them. Lord, that you would set them free right now to, to maybe they're at home, they can pray out loud. Or if they're in the pew here today, they can pray out loud or they can just whisper to themselves. But Lord, help them to pray, Jesus, come into my life and forgive me of my sins. I receive you right now, Jesus, as not just my Savior, but my Lord. Help me to be what you want me to be. Help me to let go of things and let you have control. And Jesus, adopt me into your family. I wanna be your child today. Thank you, Jesus, for hearing my prayer. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for coming into my heart, into my life, and for making me a child of God. If you pray a prayer like that, God's gonna hear it, and God's gonna make you his child right now. Lord, I pray for those that raised a hand that, that are struggling with something Lord, that, 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 that they've been robbed of the peace and the hope that you have for us. Lord, it's inevitable that we're gonna suffer, but Lord, we don't suffer alone because your Holy Spirit is working in us. Lord, you said that you would pour into us joy and peace as we put our trust in you. And Lord, that by the power of the Holy Spirit, we'll experience your hope. And so Lord, I pray that, that right now a miracle would take place in this room. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would come to every person who raised their hands, for every person at home that raised their hands. Lord, I, hope, I pray that by your Spirit, you would visit them right now. And Lord, that you would give them the power of your Spirit. Lord, that you would set them free. And Lord, as they open their heart to receive from you, Lord, I pray you would take away those things that are holding them back. Lord God, I pray you would take away the doubt and the anxiety. Lord, I pray you would take away the stress, Lord God. Lord, I pray that you would take away the darkness, Lord, that dark cloud that they might be experiencing right now and Lord as they open their hands right now and say I let go Jesus please take it away Lord I pray that in that symbol of, 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 of release to you Lord I pray that you would just work a miracle Holy Spirit I pray you would work a miracle God you created us you can be in many places at one time Lord you are in people's homes right now if people are listening in the car Lord you can be in the car Lord God you're in this room right now I, I know that you're here and Lord, I pray that you would heal hearts right now. Lord, I pray that you would heal minds right now. Lord, I pray that you would restore unto us the joy of our salvation. Lord, the things that take away our peace. Lord, I pray that the peace that's beyond our understanding. Lord, the, the peace that transcends our understanding. Lord, I pray that it would fill our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus right now. We receive it, Lord, right now. Fill us with your peace, Lord. Lord, help us not to obsess on things that bring us down, but Lord, help us to meditate on the hope of your glory. Lord, help us to boast in the hope of your glory. Lord, someday we're gonna be with you. We're gonna walk fine, our hands are gonna work, our back's not gonna hurt. Lord, because we're gonna be in a place where there's no more pain and no more sorrow, no more sickness and no more death. Lord, help us to remind ourselves of that when the enemy wants to discourage us and bring us down. And Lord, help us to experience the hope of our eternal salvation. And Lord, if there's anybody going through a difficult time right now, I pray that you would go with them. Lord, I pray that you would join them in the fire and let them see you. Just as King, just as King, the King, King Nebuchadnezzar, I believe, just as he saw a fourth person in that fire when he only threw three people in. Lord, I pray you would reveal yourself to us so that we know that you're always with us. Thank you, Jesus, for being with us. Thank you for never leaving us. Lord, thank you for always being there for us. Help us to sense your presence. Help us to be more aware this week of your presence with us, I pray. And Lord, I thank you for everyone that's here today. Lord, I pray that you would minister to them. Lord, I pray that they not just hear your word and forget it tomorrow or Tuesday, but Lord, I pray you remind us this week, Lord, that because God, you poured out your love into our hearts, we can experience hope and peace and your glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen. God bless you, thanks for coming today. Feel free to join us in the cafeteria for bagels and coffee.
And uh, feel free to greet one another there or in the foyer. God bless you.